Numbers chapter 13, if you would turn your Bibles there, please. Numbers chapter 13, it's good to have everybody here this morning. We've got a few visitors, we're glad to have you this morning, want you to feel at home. And uh, I want everybody to treat you nice, be nice to you. And uh, maybe the Lord will bring you back the next Sunday. We'd love to see you again. Numbers chapter 13. Everybody in this church that's here today at one time came as a visitor. You ever think about that? Yeah. They came as a visitor. And uh, some, have, some have stayed and we thank God for that. Numbers chapter 13. Now, uh, let me <clears throat> see if there's anything before that. No. Uh, I'm going to back up just a little bit uh, and just kind of give you the sense and the meaning of the story that's in Numbers chapter 13. And um, I was wanting to sing a different song this morning, um, bigger than any mountain, because the song mentions that God is bigger than the giants. And here in Numbers 13, we're dealing with the giants. And uh, for those of you who... Uh, have not heard this, uh, Goliath was not the only giant uh, in those days. Um, the entire land of Canaan, uh, the Bible says, was, was full uh, of men of great stature, the Bible says. That's in verse 32 of this chapter that we're in. And so, and we know from Scripture how they came to be. Genesis chapter 6 tells us that the sons of God, which are angels... Bad angels, not good ones, uh, which are forbidden to marry. They left their estate, Jude says, and they came to this world and took wives of human women. And when they took them as wives, um, then children were born to them. Uh, the Bible says in Genesis 6, the same became mighty men of old, men of renown. But they were called the giants. And it is because, partly and because of their great stature. And we're not just talking about tall people. We're talking about monstrous, hideous, uh, hybrid or half-breeds or whatever you want to call them. But they were always evil in the Bible. Always. They were and remain our biggest enemies. Uh, you say, how is that, Pastor Mike? Uh, when I studied this several years ago, I was absolutely amazed that at least part of our doctrine of salvation, or I say ours, Christianity in general, that our understanding of how God saves us and what God does for us and um, the maintaining of that salvation uh, is based in part upon the story of Numbers 13 and Numbers 14. Because Paul wrote in Hebrews that he told of, he, he referenced this passage and said at this time, Israel had a choice to either go into the promised land right then or not go in and they chose to not go in. And God said, because of that, uh, I made them wander in the wilderness for 40 years until they all died. Not one of those people got to go into the promised land. Only two men who left Egypt, Joshua and Caleb, were allowed to go into the promised land. They were the only two that came back from uh, visiting the land of the giants. There used to be a TV show. You remember that? A long time ago. Okay? But anyway... Um, they were the only two that came back and said, we can go, we can go in. God, God's going to take care of this for us. The other, ten came, the other ten spies came back and said, they're all giants in there and their cities are walled up to heaven. And oh my goodness, there, there's men of great statue there and the sons of Anak there, the Anakim. And I mean, they're huge monsters. We, there's just no way in the world that we can go in. So that's the setup of the story. Twelve spies go into the promised land for 40 days to spy it out. 
You remember from last Sunday, they come bringing in that one cluster of grapes that represents the new wine. That was their salvation right there. And they denied themselves of it simply by listening to the 10 spies who said, we cannot go in. Let's pick it up. Numbers chapter 13, verse 26. They went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. That was that. Uh, they brought pomegranates and all kinds of things back, but that one cluster of grapes, that gigantic cluster of grapes, was, I believe, God, God grew that and made it as big as it was to show the people of Israel this land is a wonderland. It's got things like that in it. it. Reminds me of the four kids that go into Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. You remember that scene where they go into that room and everything in there is edible? What kid in this church would not like to walk into a factory room where everything in there was edible candy? <laughs> Bob, you can take your grandpa in with you. He's going with you. But they, they could have looked at that and said, Wow, that's for us? But they didn't. And so in verse 27, they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sinnest, and surely it floweth with milk and honey. And this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, now, when you hear somebody say that, or the word but, when a doctor comes out of an emergency room or a hospital room and says to you, your husband or your wife or your dad or your mom or your child is stable, but, when they get to that word but, your heart sinks. But, nevertheless. That means to us that something bad is fixing to come our way. I, I don't like that word in that sense. But, Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land. And the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. Now, remember, I've, I'm preaching this on different levels. One is just for all of us who have left Egypt. And we're on our way to the promised land. We're not there yet. And there's a lot of things between us and heaven that stand in our way. And all of us are going to need to hold on to God's hand to get us there. Say amen. That is for everybody. The second uh, level or understanding of this is that a situation of life where you're not happy with something going on in your life, you're not happy at your work, you're not happy at uh, your home, you're not happy, you're not happy with your church, you're not happy, uh, or or maybe maybe there's changes that need to be made in you. And you recognize it. Uh, I, was, I almost preached a sermon this morning on looking in the mirror. But God changed my mind. Because when we look in the mirror, we don't like what we see. Everybody's got to face that mirror sooner or later. Amen? But anyway, so we have things in our life that uh, we want to be right. We want them to be 
fruitful for God. We want, we, want a, we want peace. We want comfort. We want stability. We don't have it. And so uh, we look at these sermons. We look at these passages as, okay, this can be applied to my life. How? Uh, maybe in my life, maybe I need to quit smoking or maybe, you know, maybe just any, any number of things. And you say, you know, I need God's help. And so these are, these are for that level. But then, uh, as I've mentioned from the very beginning, uh, those of you who struggle with various addictions. And um, I want you to look at verse 28 again. Those of you who have been or are now addicted to something, I want you to ask yourself the question, why, why are you? Why, why, do you? why do you seek that out? And the answer is pretty clear. I told you to look at verse 28. He said, nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land. Think about this for a minute. Because the people really are the reason why they're not going in. It's not the city. It's not the houses there. It's not anything else. It's the people. They cannot, they cannot imagine how they can defeat those people because they're strong. Ask yourself the question, those of you who have or are now, or maybe one of these days, somebody listening to me now could end up getting hooked on something. It happens. Because the devil is the hook master. Amen? And I don't care what it is. He'll get you hooked on something. Take you away from God's word. Take you away from walking right with God or whatever it is. But think about why somebody sips down a shot of Jack Daniels. Why does somebody do that? Well, it gives them a buzz. Gives them a good one. They like the feeling of it. They like the feeling of it going down. They like the feeling of it when it hits their nervous system. And it's a strong feeling. Feels good, doesn't it? And it feels good because it's sin. Sin always feels good. If it, if it didn't, I've always said this. If, if sin didn't feel good, we wouldn't be sinners, would we? Nobody ever says, man, I hate drinking whiskey. Go, 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 go. Then why do you do it? I don't know. If you liked it, you like tasting whiskey, you like pouring it down in you, you like the buzz that you get, the high, the feeling in your nerves or whatever it is. You like that feeling. And it's a strong one. And the thought of putting that glass down or that bottle down and walking away from it, that's a hard thought. That's a hard thought. People that, I heard you, Roy. He said, yes, it is. People that take drugs. Street drugs or prescription drugs? Same thing. It hits you. It's a strong feeling. And once you get hooked on it, the thought of quitting is a near impossible thought. You say, I can't, I can't do it. I can't do it. The people are strong. And they're, they're what's stopping you from giving it up. I'm not going to spend much time on, on this, but simply because of the children's sake. But those hooked on adult media is what I'll say. You understand 
That also, there's a buzz to that, a high, a feeling. It's a natural thing. In fact, our response, our body's response to drugs, to alcohol, to uh, adultery and fornication, our body's response to that, God built into us, built it into us as part of being fruitful and multiplying and replenishing the earth. I mean, there's a good thing for, uh, that goes along with it if it's done right inside God's will, and that is in a marriage. Okay? There's a, there's a, there's a good thing for it. But not too many people that I've ever met in life could truly deny themselves of that feeling for life. Paul did. Paul didn't have to be married. He had a gift given to him by God that because of his ministry and as, as intense as he was, he didn't want to be dragging around a wife and kids. He just couldn't do it. He's, he spent all of his time in the Word of God, laboring in the Word of God and preaching. And, but Paul understood... The feeling. And he said, God gave you marriage for that. So it's, when it's outside of that marital bond, that's when it becomes sin. And it's a, and it's a feeling that is strong. And it's nearly impossible to deny yourself that. Those, those people who call themselves Catholic priests who tell everybody to believe them when they say that they're celibate, they're lying through their teeth. They are. They are lying. Practically every Catholic priest is hooked on some form of something that they ought not be hooked on. Practically every one of them. And the hierarchy of the church knows this. This is how we keep people in line. This is how we control them. Because they have to confess these things in the confessional. And we know this about them. And we could ruin them. So they do what we tell them to do. That's just a little conspiracy theory I've got. But the bottom line is, you're hooked on a feeling. There's a song written about that, wasn't it? You're hooked on that, and, the, and it's like the giants that are in the land. You see that, and you're being told, no, you can't have that ever again. And the thought of that, it's a giant to you. It's a giant. The people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. In Numbers 13, verse 30. Now Caleb is going to try to convince them, we can go. Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it. For we are well able to overcome it. But the men, listen, listen, listen to your Bible. Let us go up at once and possess it. For we are well able to overcome it. Caleb is not stupid. He knows they're giants. But he knows that the God that he serves is bigger than the giants. Amen. And he's bigger than every one of them that stands in front of you. And tries to keep you from going in and claiming what God promised he will give you. If you overcome. Those giants stand in the way. And when we look at them, we almost say, forget it, I'm not doing it. We are well able to overcome it, verse 31. But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people. For they are stronger than we. Your friends, your friends or your family members or people that you work with, guys that you work with, will tell you, hey, I do stuff like that all the time. It don't bother me. I ain't got a problem with it. Nobody tells me what I can do with my body. 
And I, listen, I smoke marijuana every night and I, I take some pills here and I do this and I drink a little and I chase women whenever I get them or whatever. And I'm talking about, the, I'm not saying I do these things. I'm talking about the guys you work with or people you work with, the women that you work with. They'll tell you that it's, that it's no big deal for them and they'll tell you, you know, why you, you go to that church? Why you want to go to that church? And man, I mean... You know, have a little fun. Here, take, take some of these and try them at home. Don't listen to that stuff. They said, we be not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report. You know what the opposite of that evil report is? It's Isaiah 53. Who hath believed our report? You know what that report is in Isaiah 53? It's the prophecy concerning Christ on the cross. By His stripes we are what? Now, who in here does not believe that the cross can free you from years of addictions? You don't believe that. I believe it. I believe the stripes of Christ on the cross heal us from whatever hooks us. They are stronger than the giants. They brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched under the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. Our nation is eaten up with drug and alcohol abuse. Right? What do our cities look like now that the liberals have gotten their way and taken over and given out free needles to everybody? Listen, I've been through downtown Denver. I've, I've, I've been to Portland before. A lot, of these, a lot of these liberal cities run by liberal mayors and liberal uh, city council members. They give out free needles. They, they practically legalize all drugs done in the downtown area. And you have multi-million dollar businesses in the downtown area that they use to try to bring in tourist traffic and those people have to walk through tents they have to walk around uh, sleeping bags and uh, bags of junk that homeless people that are sitting out on the street and and feces on the sidewalk all over the place and it's gotten worse in the last three years has it not Sure it has. Now they've got all the illegals bust up there. They got what they asked for, didn't they? Oh, we're sanctuary city. Come up here. And now you got the governor of New York saying, we got to get rid of these people. You let them in. Turkey. Oh, wait a minute. I got to keep preaching. Verse 33 and there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which came of the giants, and we were in our side, own side as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Our nation is eaten up with alcohol and drug addiction. Our nation is eaten up with sins of adultery addictions. Our school children, our school children are producing adult media using their phones or tablets and their internet connection. This is a known issue. It is a very serious problem. Do not let your child have uncontrolled access to the Internet. Period. Period. Don't let them do it. Or they'll be looking for your daughter at some sleazy hotel of some 40-year-old guy posing as a 20-year-old stud to your 14-year-old granddaughter. This is America. Father, I ask your blessings on this message in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's the message. Here's what... Turn back now. Turn to Numbers 14. It's right there. I want you to see what Israel's response was 
to this report. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried. And the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. Why did they murmur against Moses and Aaron? Moses and Aaron didn't do anything wrong. But let me, let me say this. Everybody look up here for a second. I got you looking up here and I'm, I'm not going to look at you now. Because I don't want you to think I'm just pointing you out. I know for a fact. I, listen, I've been in this all my life. I know for a fact that when the sins creep back into your life, the first thing that happens is you lay your Bible down and you miss that first Sunday. And then the next Sunday. And then the next Sunday. It's like, I don't want to see Pastor Mike today. I don't want to go to church. Why? Well, you know the reason why. You don't want to feel guilty. You don't want to feel guilty. Well, how do you think I feel? I've got to be here anyway and preach this stuff that I'm guilty of. But I've got to do it. So, look at what they said. Would, would God that we had died in the land of Egypt... Or would God we had died in this wilderness? Wherefore hath the Lord brought us in unto this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return in... Look at what it says. To return into Egypt. You know what Egypt is. Egypt is where your drugs are. Egypt is where... You got the whiskey bottle hid. Egypt is the uh, adult media sites that you go to. That's Egypt. And you say, you know what? I can't fight this. It's not working. I'm going to give up and I'm going to quit. And I'm going to go back to the way I was. Let us return into Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. Moses and Aaron, they got it, man. They, they were like, we got to pray for these people. Now, let us return into Egypt is what I'm preaching to you this morning. Going back to what God brought you out of is the stupidest idea you have ever thought of in your life. Can I say that to you? In love, going back to the bar, going back to the drugs, going back to all the other stuff is the stupidest idea. Now, you know, for just to be fair, you weren't alone in thinking that thought. The devil helped out. And he's trying to talk you into it. Go back to Egypt. Go back to Egypt. Go back. Because he knows that once he's got you there, he's keeping you there. But it's the stupidest idea. Don't do it. Just, you can't go back. You just can't. You don't want to. It'll be, you know what the Bible says? First in, uh, first Peter, second Peter, it says in there that it's like a dog. My granddaughter's got a, a, a view of something they've never seen before. We picked up Michaela and her dog, Bear, and was bringing them out to the house. And the dog, when we got pulled in the driveway, started puking in our car. Michaela's going, uh, the dog's puking in the floor. And I'm just going, you know how those words. And then Michaela shouts out, he's eating it. 
What did Peter say? It's a dog returning to his own vomit. God designed dogs to do that. And he gave us that analogy. Would you lick up your own vomit? No! You don't even want to clean it up. It's so foul, it revolts us, doesn't it? Don't be a dog. Don't be a dog. Don't go back. It's that simple. And then here's another one. I started looking in the Bible at all the places where Israel said, we're going back. Deuteronomy 1. Uh, notwithstanding, you would not go up, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God. This is uh, Moses' commentary on what just happened, where they wouldn't go in because there were giants in there, and they said, we can't go in there, so we're not going. Uh, and you murmured in your tents and said, because the Lord hated us. He had, now, do you really believe that? Do you really believe that God is so evil that He would bring you out to almost freedom only to crush and destroy you? Do you really believe that? Now listen, I've thought that thought before. So I know what it's like. And you're like, man, I can't, I can't do this. God, did you bring me this far? Just to destroy me? Let me just tell you something that you should already know. God does not hate you. God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Whither shall we go up? Verse 28, Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying the people is greater and taller than we. The cities are great and walled up to heaven, and moreover, we've seen the sons of the Anakims there. Then I said unto you, dread not. That's what I started out here with, dread not. Dread not, neither be afraid of them. The Lord your God, which goeth before you, he shall fight for you, according to all that he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. Pastor, are you saying that if I call upon the Lord that God will deliver me yes now I'm not I'm not going to uh, say that if you get told you have to get in some kind of therapy or counseling or whatever I'm not going to tell you that, not, don't do that, because then God, I don't, I don't believe that. Um, just be careful, in counseling, there's a lot of new age practices. And um, just be careful of that. But ultimately, the one who's going to deliver you is not the counselor. It's not AA, it's JC, Jesus Christ. He's the one that when it's all said and done, he gets all the glory and all the praise. Pastor, does it work? Yes, I'm telling you it works. God has delivered me. God will deliver you. In his time and in his way, but he will do it. God will in no wise cast out any of us who come to him seeking mercy. Um, the Lord your God which goeth before you, he shall fight for you according to all that he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. So you remember what got you here? God's still doing. He's still the same God that he was when he first came to you and brought you out of Egypt, he's the same God, isn't he? The same God that put it into your mind and your heart that you need to get right, that you need to quit, that you need to uh, move on from this and, and find a better life. Amen. Amen. Number 16, turn there. Korah. 
This is called in the New Testament the gainsaying of Korah. Paul actually brought it up. Or uh, uh, Peter did. Talking about the gainsaying of Korah. How Korah was there to talk the Israelites into going back to Egypt. And taking over for Moses. Now, I studied this out one time. I don't know. God let me. I don't know. And I, I'm not sure, exactly sure what it all means. But Korah and Moses were first cousins. Moses' dad and Korah's dad were brothers. And they both had the same grandpa. The genealogies bear that out. So Korah... It's like a little family feud, a little family fight. We're going to see who's, it, who's really in charge here. Korah is like, who's Moses? I mean, he was gone for 40 years, acting like he was some Pharaoh over us. Now he's going to be our, our leader. So now Korah, the son of Izar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi. Moses was of Levi. And Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moses. Listen, there's always going to be something that tries to rise up between you and your living for God. The devil will throw stuff at you and block you on Sunday morning. Oh, you can't go to church. Look at there. You got this and you got that. You got all this over here. You can't go to church. You can't read your Bible. You got, you got things to tend to. You can't do this. You can't do that. And that's what it's all about. Rising up against what God is wanting to do in your life through serving Him and separate you from it because He knows. You know what? I'm going to do this again. Turn to Proverbs 16.3. Uh, I'm going to give you a verse that was ringing a bell in my heart all day yesterday. Proverbs 16, 3. Man, oh man, a, a friend of mine sent it to me. He sends me a verse a day every day. You underline this in your Bible. Make you a, make you a bumper sticker if you want to. Or put, up a, put it up on Facebook or something. Proverbs 16, 3. Commit thy works unto the Lord. That means do what's right in God's sight, not, not in yours. Live your, live your home life like you're living it for God. Uh, Paul said it. How did Paul say it? Uh, do all things as unto the Lord. Do everything that you do like you're doing it for God. Like it really matters. So in your home life, live for God while you are at home. Again, Christianity is not a Sunday only club. It is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It is 24 hours, 7 days a week. This is who we are and what we do. Amen. Commit thy works unto the Lord and thy thoughts will be established. You know what that means? Instead of you thinking about taking a drink all day long, God establishes your thoughts on His Word, on His holiness, on His life, on, on things that God has done for you already. He establishes your thoughts and takes away the thought of you going back to doing what you know you're not supposed to be doing. Amen to that. So verse 3, they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, You take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift you up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. They were going to take them back. Do you remember what happened to them? The ground opened up and swallowed every one of them 250 people gone just like that and when the ground closed back up all the rest of the Israelites are going we're on Moses side numbers 21 turn there numbers 21 
Verse 4, And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom, that's Esau's land. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. Discouragement's part of life, people. Discouragement's part of life. No amount of your alcohol or your drugs or your adult life can ever soften the blow of discouragement. All you're doing is making it worse. Because with every high, there's always a coming down. The people were much discouraged because of the way, and the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. Here again, questioning why they brought them out of Egypt. And they would have gone back. But what did God do here? He sent fiery serpents in amongst them and bit and killed thousands of them. And when the serpents, the fiery serpents, kept biting everybody, they said, Moses, do something for us. Call unto God. And God said, Moses, make that brass serpent, put it on a pole, lift it up. When the people look on it, if they've been bitten, they shall live. And Jesus, that is the basis for the gospel. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. You know what that serpent is to you? It's your addiction. It bites, doesn't it? Stings. And Christ took it to the cross and killed it for you. That serpent. Don't go back. Exodus 14. When Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes. This is now they've just left Egypt. They just have left Egypt. When Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians marched after them and they were so afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Here they are again saying, God, did you bring me out here to die? I mean, it's like they're saying the same thing over and over and over again. They can't think of anything else to say, but they're worried about their lives. Did you bring us out here to die? Let me tell you something about death. To the saint, death is the holiday we've been looking for. The rest that we needed, amen. And I'm not afraid of death. I'm afraid it'll hurt. Amen. Uh, Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egypt? And some people, they will not come to church, and they will not listen to this message. So those of you online, you're going to, you think, boy, I'm going to share this with somebody I know because they've really hooked on this, they're hooked on that. And, and you give it to them and they're going, I'm not going to listen to this. You know what they're going to say? Leave me alone with that stuff. Let us alone. That we may serve the Egyptians. You know, I, and I'll be honest with you. Some of the people that you know that may be uh, hooked on something... You're trying to witness to them. You're trying to help them. They may not be ready to come out yet. The whole thing has got to turn on them. And it always does. It always does. In some cases, these addictions turn into a prison sentence. Or at least a uh, felony charge. All of them can, in various ways, turn into a life in prison. You don't want that. 
Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Proverbs 23. Now I want you to turn here, because there is something I want you to see. It's at the, at the bottom of the page there, but I, w- I want to read down to it so you understand. Roy, you'll like this. Proverbs 23, 29. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Contentions are, you know, what a contender is. He's a fighter, a boxer. Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine. Now don't limit what God is saying here. Wine here will represent everything that you can get addicted to. Because it feels good. Feels good. You get a buzz out of it. They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a what? What, what did God send? Serpents. Is this Bible right or what? At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women. Look at that. Adultery and drugs or alcohol linked together. Hmm. Thine eyes shall behold strange women. And thine heart shall utter perverse things. Thine heart shall utter these things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea. This is your life. Or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast on a sailboat. The top is always doing this. In other words, you are never stable. Ever. You think you have it under control. You don't. Verse 35. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? Six words. I will seek it yet again. That's what every drunk says. After every good bender. And they're full of woe, sorrow. They got into a fight. Their speech, you can't understand a word they're saying. And it was the wine that did it to them. And they'll wake up next morning with a pounding headache, puking their guts up. And when they can get to where they can stand up again, what's the first thing they do? What do they they drink for breakfast? Jim Beam for breakfast, Jack for lunch. I will seek it yet again. Doesn't matter how many times you've done it. You always want to go back to it. And that's every time the Israelites got it. it, Every time it got a little bit hard now. What they did was they pulled this thing out. Let's go back to Egypt. Because like they didn't have it hard in Egypt, right? No, Pharaoh was making them make bricks without giving them straw. They had to stay up all night to gather up enough scraps of straw out of the field to make the same amount of bricks for that next day. That's how bad he made their work. He didn't care how many people died either. He didn't care. Because those Israelites were popping out kids all over the place. And he's like, slave labor, hey, this is going to be free. I can kill as many as I want. They're going to make more. 
I'm just telling you, you don't, want to, you don't really want to go back to Egypt. You don't. I know the thoughts there. But think it through and look at it the way God just showed it to you. And say to yourself, what am I doing? What am I doing? There is a better way. And it comes by the way of the cross of Jesus Christ. Let's stand to our feet.